All right, so we've completed our painting. We're going to go as far as we're going to go with this particular process. Um, and I hope that um, through the period of time this took to produce, you could see some steps and decision making and uh, sort of the process of creative reasoning getting us from one uh, point to another. Uh, I'm going to break this down in notes. I'm going to draw over the top so that we can see some of the things in depth that I'm thinking about in terms of creating forms or pulling them out of the images that we were working with. So I'll work on this notes layer. We're going to do it at 100% opacity in black. And But let's go back to the beginning and have a look. So this was our foot image and a pretty aggressive, gross, kind of distracting image that was really hard to get past. And uh, But it is a wonderful challenge in terms of teaching ourselves to uh, begin to push past the image we're presented and look for patterns in that chaos. So now that we've uh, we, we took the first step, we made some marks on the page, which really helps us, and then we mirrored and uh, uh, flipped and overlay the images to get this sort of Rorschach shape based on the foot. And you can see the example of the toes and stuff here at the top. What I began to see here was a sense of a crown piece. So you have all of this and you have this sort of shape. The fact that it's mirrored really helps to bring out some some uh, form. But the one thing that really took this over the top was going up here to filter and to artistic and pl using plastic wrap filter on this. And one of the reasons I like to do that is that it creates highlights and it creates shadows and you begin to see um, surfaces rather than texture. So now this surface is reading more and I begin to see this as a forehead. So that was one of the first steps that really started to develop the image. Let's go to this part here and uh, I'll just control A and delete that note so we can continue continue writing. Now it changed quite a bit from here. You still have the crown available or, or visible and I left it alone for the most part, but we started to develop this lower section. Now, are every design that we pull out of here good designs? Not necessarily, but they have the potential to be good designs, and that is the thing I want you to take away from this process. Saving them in groups like this allows us to go back and make different decisions. If we took this image, perhaps, to the end, it would look as good as our, our final image, but it would also represent a total different direction based on the available context we're pulling out of that image. So I, I want you to um, rec or, or remember, not everyone's going to be gold, but they have the potential to be gold if you want to spend the time to develop them from this point forward. So one of the things that in this image, getting back to it, what, what I began to pull out of here was these shapes began to look more like ears and kind of reconciling what this form is. Began asking myself questions like, okay, if this is a cranium, we have sort of a squid shape going on, what are these really? It's an interesting shape, but how does that make sense biologically? Well, these are, on a squid would be, you know, its ability to push water and move through, move through its environment be able to suck in water, push it out, and use it like a jet to get from one position to the other. A very effective mode of transportation in a water environment. Is this creature, if I continued with this creature, it would have become sort of an aquatic inspired character. Um, but I couldn't pick an area for the eyes. And though I worked on them here and started to drop specs to make sort of a multiple uh, pupil eye, it didn't reconcile with the fact that this propulsion system was so close. And on, a, on this style of neck and with this type of chest, it began to feel a little foreign. So I just made a decision to move away from this and begin, uh, without spending much more time to uh, develop the biology to make this make sense, move on to the next one and leave this for another time. And that's one of the things that, this is why we have so many options here, is because the decisions were made to to leave this, try something else, because this is something that we can come back to afterward. Let's move on to the next one. And that's a, this is a dramatic change um, from one to the next. But what sparked this change? Well, if you look at what remained, it's really the ears. 
or what would have been the ears, this dark section plus a little bit of this particular uh, detail. So we started to build profiles around those choices. And what I did do was, if you can see the shape here, I began, to, I pulled this shape out and created the crown of the next image in the same sort of feel. So now we're mimicking systems or mimicking forms on the on the uh, in the pattern elsewhere. So creating a new profile gets us a good start. And uh, also this line here began to um, it began to read as sort of a mouth form. When I when I decided these weren't eyes, this started to pop out at me. So in terms of creative reasoning and biology. When this wasn't working, I switched gears and tried to find forms in the image that allowed me to make sense of the suggested biology. So now we have a mouth here, a very high mouth in terms of the, in the proportions of the head, it was about halfway. Now that's unusual, but with these here looking sort of like eyes outside uh, on the side of the head, it can almost get away with that. Um, and there are creatures in nature who have position, eye positions that are close to the crook of the jaw or the mouth. So it's not an implausibility. This, however, began to bother me in this image. Because of that position change, with the chin so low, this did not seem to make sense. And I could not reconcile, although this is a cool form, what these were becoming. So biologically, I'm looking at this. It's a cool shape. Can I make it make sense? I took this as far as I could go. And then I said, okay, let's, again, let's leave this for another exploration and move on and try and find a concept or a uh, context within this image that falls within um, a, a biological possibility. This is the one that really started to uh, make sense. And you can see when you flip back and forth here, the areas that I keyed off of or that made sense to me remained in the image. So this center portion began to make sense. We had the mouth, or what became a mouth area, and this piece. This piece always remained, and I, I fought it and I fought it. But there's something about this that is that always caught my eye. So it's that center focus, something that stuck. But you can see it remained, and this remained, and that is where these elements started to make sense: an ear, a lower jaw, the chin was now lower the position from here up with with the mouth lower on the profile of the head you know the profile of your head is here and here you have mouth less than halfway and you have eyes roughly halfway so this whole proportion was starting to work out and this profile which we started in previous uh, iterations still inspired by the centerpiece began to play really well with the point of the ears. And I mean, if you look at this graphically, that is a very strong arrow shape. And it is um, graphically a very interesting profile, but it reads well with the posture. With the long neck and the mouth indicated uh, where it was, this began to read as a very strong chin and, uh, and attitude, which was appealing. And the new eye positions, um, really worked well with uh, that whole thing. So once again, once this happened, once the neck was done, the position of the mouth was finalized, finalized, the eye positions came in and everything else began to fall into place. So now we continue on. This is a dramatic change. Bang! Where did that come from? And the answer is, I have no idea. <laughs> well, let's look at how, how it could have, how it developed. Um, we'll break down the steps here in group four. So we started out with this, this uh, image, the mouth position, the jaw and teeth, which uh, really started to uh, become more of a component uh, of the design. And it was positioned well in essentially what would become 
uh, or the ear areas. But this started to really pop out too, this little upper cheek form. And what I was doing here, and you could, in the video, I'm adding a lot of lighter color across this shape. And I'm creating planes in, my, in the painting to indicate a form facing upward. And then what I wanted, I think what I began to see was this as a horn shape coming up from that and then drawing backwards towards the eyes and then cresting here. So I was picking colors from the canvas and trying to bring that shape uh, a little more into focus. Uh, and the lower jaw, of course, were sort of these flat, planier shapes and the square jaw kind of jutting out here uh, to create this lower shape. And you can really start to see the planarity that I'm thinking about as I go through here. And this is one of the, the, the principles of creative reasoning. Keeping things simple and planar, even in sculpture and paintings, helps you determine light source, color picking, but it also simplifies in your mind a forward motion. And when you bring those elements down to their simplest form, you can begin to handle them a little easier. And I hope that's what I demonstrated here in terms of moving through uh, the uh, moving through the painting and getting some uh, getting some uh, forward motion. All right, so there's our notes there. We started to add elements on top and filter them and create more patterns and more textures, but that still that shape is prevalent. The ears, the jaw position, the eye position remained. Again, all the elements that we felt worked remain. And then we added, we built right on top of that. But you can see the planarity pops as soon as this image comes up. So there is our highlight there. Right, those things are still remaining. There's where the development begins to happen. And now it's just becoming tighter and tighter. The brush sizes are getting smaller. We're working closer in and making, um, making uh, more specific choices. Now this has almost gone too far. In trying to develop what this is, not that this is a bad painting, it's a bit tight and it leads a bit more work, but things started to happen here that were really not working for me. The slit in the face could not, I could not reconcile what this is biologically. When I'm thinking of characters or, or animals that have, you know, breaks in the face like this, usually dead. You've usually hit, you've usually hit a wall, you've run into a propeller. There's something about this that seems foreign and the exact the exact bisection of the face and sort of the evenness of it um, began to really bother me. So this is when things started to change. So now we wipe that away and we start to play with a cleaner facial structure, although the planarity is still there. When you look back at this, this is what's changed. Now we're running this plane, let me turn this right up, we're running this plane right down here. We're cutting through this and we're sort of joining these up and continuing this down here. So I mean decisions in the overall form are starting to to happen. And uh, this was a big one. We also extended the head a little bit, trying to reconcile what was happening here by playing with this outer form. But again, the, the, the one graphic element that's maintained throughout the choices is this very large, uh, strong arrow shape in the character that's moving upward. The eyes, after a certain point, never changed because there was something about them that worked right off the bat. The position was great. This mouth position, I don't believe changed until the end. And then we came back to it. 
But all of these planar elements that we developed in the first few layers of the piece remained. So as you can tell as we move forward, the things that I liked stayed, the things that I didn't like really um, I made an effort to develop them so they felt real uh, in terms of uh, shape and uh, biology. Let's discuss on the next one a little bit about the underskull or what uh, what bothered me about the arrow shape and how it affected sort of the decisions of facial structure. So on this one here let's just let's just look a little bit more. So the things that changed were the shape of the head this is a very tall painting. It was getting right up to the top of the uh, of the um, of the page, and it really began to feel like I was trying to stretch the character to fill the sheet. Um, and I recognize that as a bad habit of mine: is trying to do something that fills the page. So I stopped and analyze whether that was a decision that I was making for biological reasons or because uh, of a of a bad practice. And when I determined that was bad practice, bam, the head changes. All right? It really had to had to change to make not only the character make sense, but to correct um, but to correct a habit that that I knew was was uh, bad. In, on my part. But I only recognize that because of some experience in having um, those decisions uh, uh, cause bad results. So that shape changes. I still wanted the height, but I needed to make it make sense biologically. There are some character or creatures on our world that do have crests and horns and things like that. But one of the questions that I ask myself is what's the purpose of having the horn? And when, when I decided that this horn was going to be a part of uh, mating practice or mating ritual, I knew I had to decorate it. So this is becoming a, a decorative piece, an attractive and mating approach. But it also could be used for defense. Um, it could be styled in a ram's horn. And um, one of the things we're going to do next is uh, to explain how this may look in a side view. We're going to take this character, reduce it down, and, and do a uh, transfer to a side view and a top view and just kind of develop what this character would be in a few more dimensions. But you can see how this works better graphically. Although the planar elements have not changed, um, you can begin to see, you know, uh, the um, uh, example of light source of shading the shadow under the chin so light's more coming like that. And uh, is it perfect? No, not really. But in terms of uh, a concept, there's enough information in here that we could we could move forward uh, with a design and have it work out fairly well. So those are those notes. Once this was determined, the changes from here out become more about playing with uh, the biology, playing with mouth position, and deciding what kind of feeling this character would have. There was something humorous about this that I didn't I didn't like right off the bat and it's a sort of a smirky thing. Having the the teeth come out and having the um, uh, excuse me the mouth this wide does it really work and when we change the shape of the head in the mouth in terms of scale because now the height isn't there began to feel out of place. So let's go back to this there is the reason for that mouth change. But again, that cute kind of um, happy expression didn't suit the feeling of the rest of this. There was something about the eyes that didn't work with this. Although nothing else changed, I think, in this other than playing with the mouth. But this is a good this is a good iteration that may we may be, may be able to use later. So of course we keep it and we move on to the next one. And here's where we began to play with final position. So this is what we ended up with. We moved the mouth down, scaled it so that it was positioned. But if we look now at the proportions of this head, we start to have human, more human 
proportions, position of the mouth, what might have been a nose, eye position, forehead. This is pretty close to human proportions. And although I like this, when I did it, there was a, a feeling of, yeah, you know what, that works. The scale of the mouth works. But again, the feeling that this evoked was a bit of surprise and uh, something sympathetic about this character. And I'm not sure that that is what I wanted to portray, but I'm making those decisions as I move along. Once the planarity of the of the image is established, once the sort of biology or of this character is established, we can work on a feeling in this painting or in our in our design. So what I decided to do was bring, I think what I said was group four, an image from group four forward and ghost it over the top for a couple of reasons. One, there is still a tightness about this that um, hadn't gone away yet. And placing this over the top gave me, uh, basically made the decision for me to place the mouth back and this jaw element back uh, where it was. And it's just something about the attitude that it evoked. And now the mouth position is in line with this cheek element. It's right there and it's back to here. It moved the expression up the face. It gave the chin some height and a, and a different attitude that read better with the geometry of the painting um, and giving, it, uh, giving this creature some feeling. And I think that essentially was the final decision in making uh, making this move. So that basically did it for me. We added highlights to suggest mouth position and the sort of lower jaw mouth flaps and they run slightly lower than the ear but it does make sense in terms of in line with our ear. And uh, having no discernible nose I kind of like. The eyes and ear duct or eyes and uh, eye ducting that uh, that feeling worked. This ghosted image over the top softened elements that I felt were a little bit harsh, but I was able to say to myself, uh, biologically this works. Mouth position works. Emotionally it felt better and it just felt like a more um, complete concept. And then we move on to our final and basically or essentially what we did is bring some textural elements in to uh, tie some color together across the entire painting and also create a little bit of texture in the background. For me it's something that I like and I'm essentially calling that a, a final thing. So we're going to throw that down, grab our pen 100% on black and for now Call that done. All right, so as promised, let's take a look at this character and find some profiles, find a top view and a side view based on this front view that we've created so that we can understand a little bit more about uh, the volumes I'm trying to represent. But also, if we want to take this further into a design, what is a this guy really look like. Um, I've just saved this as a smaller version, dropped the DPI down and just made a much smaller uh, side so we can play with it. And uh, I'm going to take this. Uh, these were the notes from before, kind of explaining a little bit of the planarity. We're going to, you know what, I think I'm just going to grab everything and let's just back this up. Let's just reduce the size of this. So we can start talking about what that is. Let's add a new layer, throw it to the back. Let's fill that with some white. White, 100%. Fill it, okay. Let's go back to our pen tool. Let's drop the opacity down just so we can, it feels like pencil here. And 
we'll leave our notes up so we can, if we have to go back and do some discussions, we'll do that. But here is a new layer, and we'll just call this guides as we did before in the sample. Zoom in, and let's just shoot some lines off of this. Oh, I'm in white because I'm special. So we got that line there. We have point of the chin. Let's uh, let's just call that our center line for now. Point of the chin, edge of there. We'll go with that as roughly the mouth. Point to the back of the head. Point of the ear will be important, and of course eye position will want to look at that. Now as before we've got to start with the uh, top view. So we need to we need that to project our 45 degree ref reflection over or refraction and uh, let's we'll determine that that is the width of that. That is the overall width of the bony portions of the head and then we'll have a sort of a, an ear example let's call this we'll call this the back of the head for now because we haven't we we're going to have to discuss really what shapes all of this is the eye positions are going to be in there we have the center line and i think we'll just bring the point of the chin roughly to there right now All right, so our top of our head, let's start with the back. Let's just box this in. We've got to try something just to see what works. Since he doesn't exist, we're, we're designing and making it up. If our chin's here, and he has a fairly, what appears to be a fairly flat face, but maybe raked back a little bit to the point of this horn. Let's determine what the point of the horn is as well, so we can kind of guess at what an angle is going to be. Once we transfer it over, we'll really see how that works. I think it's too flat. I think it's probably here, somewhere around there. So we'll call this horn, and it appears to be a triangle. We have a highlight here. It kind of folds back, you know, so let's say you know, the horn itself looks something like this. Now, we can't really see behind this, but let's say, just for the fun of it, because something that just goes straight across, kind of boring, objects should look interesting from all the directions. I wonder what this would look like if we took it back a little bit further. Something like that, in terms of a horn shape, that then played with the point of the head, which we now, we have here. So that's going to be sort of a wide part. It comes, it looks like it comes to the point of the eye. So if the eyes are sort of in line, let's just carry that form back a little bit and see kind of where we land. Could the head be shaped something like that? Does that make sense? Maybe it has to go back a little bit further. Could do, could do. Chin, that's pretty far forward. That rake's probably going to be too much. Let's say the chin's roughly here. We have a point. Now, if this is the point of the brow, and we have a feeling that the eyes kind of sit in an oval sort of pocket, we've got a crest type or the uh, part of the orbit there. We have the ears. Now the ears come seem appear to come down from this far point and create a crest. We have we know we've got a high point in here. Where do we want those to play near the eye? We should probably draw those back a little bit. So let's say the ear does this and then draws to a point. The orbit is there. These are all working together. And the, we have 
you know, this sort of shape in the top view. Are we getting that? If the point is here. Does that appear right? This shape, this sort of chevron, is that here? Does that work? If it carries past there. Yeah, you know what? It's sort of there. Sort of there. All right, so let's keep this top view as is. We know his mouth is going to be somewhere in here, and it's roughly as wide like that. He's got a fairly strong chin, and it has this sort of lip here, this sort of edge appearance. So let's just bring that in. So it's sort of a landmark for us. And then it draws back, and it's going to disappear under this cheekbone, which goes back to the ear. And it's fairly straight. Let's erase a little of that and just tidy up what that is there. I think it feels right if it comes to there. Chin. We've got a flat spot and we have the chin and now the jaw needs to play in the top view a little bit, I think. So we're going to say it's something like that and the eyes are sort of roughly here. Now this doesn't always work out, but you have to do it a couple of times at least for the time it takes to really sketch this out. Are we you know, we're not really wasting our time here. This is sort of an important step, and I feel like we're going to learn a lot from this. So I certainly do in terms of how I develop my characters. And going through this once in a while just reiterates uh, how, or I said, strengthens the process that uh, that you use. Now, normally, actually, I'll go back to this. Normally, this brow protects the eye to some extent, so it has it should be more forward. I think the eyes are going to end up being a little further back in the head, but we'll we'll indicate that. Here, I'm just going to drop those down. I'm just going to mark them. Somewhere in this area is going to be the eyes. The ears drop down. The head has a good shape. I wonder if we should. I like that sort of ovoid kind of feel. And we've got a little attitude going in here. We have some patterns coming up the face. And then this is going to be sort of the top of the crest. Uh, I'm getting it, I'm kind of getting it. I want, actually, I feel like this needs to be longer. I'm just going to take this, move this down. stretch the back of the head out a little because I think this is going to feel better with a little bit of a longer play if this is roughly center of the head. Does that work? We're going to find out. All right, so I'm going to make a decision. I'm going to move forward with that. All right, so that's roughly what I see. Could possibly work. Now if that is, let's say that is our um, top view. Let's 
project the back of the head over. Let's project the front of the chin. Let's project our center line all the way up here. And then let's start a new layer. Let's drop a line across the page. And let's rotate that to 45 degrees. Select Enter. And let's move that over here. Let's give ourselves a mark off the top view. So this is going to be where we're going to project our center of head to. And that's where it will be, right there. Enter. And let's just drop that down so that uh, top view and guides are all on one page. Let's get a let's get a feel for this crest might change. You know, I like the the angle back, but maybe there is lines in nature that suggest strengths and weaknesses. And this inside curve from the top, the point is a little bit strong, but I feel like it's it's in the terms of the shape of the head feels a little bit weak. So let's change the profile and the length. so that it does that. And I'm liking that graphically. There's something more interesting about this graphically. So we have the sort of the pucker in the head, the uh, space for the masseter, which is your chew-in muscle. And we have cheekbones running back to the ear, which is very interesting. Very interesting look. We have that sort of pit suggested by this mark. And uh, excuse my snapping. It's dry and cold in Calgary today. All right, so we're going to leave that as is. That's a good. That's a decent start, and that'll give us a general idea of of whether our side view will work. If it doesn't work, I don't want to spend a bunch of time here um, to the point where this becomes precious and I can't erase it or start a new layer. So we'll leave it rough for now. Um, all of these are are. Uh, all of these guidelines are projected over. So let's just do this. We know the front of the chin is going to be there. We know the back of the head is going to be there. Let's do the back of our crest. It's going to end up there based on this position. And the front of the crest is going to end up here. So this is starting to be a very interesting shape. Now in this, in this front view, the angle is down. We can't determine that from this view, so we're going to have to decide how far down. Upward suggests strength. Downward suggests a little bit of weakness. But look at the posture of his face. I think downward probably works in terms of position. So let's just try that first. We'll make a mark here straight across, but we'll do a downward uh, position. Now we know the angle of his chin. His chin is here, top of the crest is here. That is the angle, general angle of his face, and that's pretty nifty. Now we need a chin. Got to come in a little bit. And then we need his ear mark is there, and mouth mark is there, and we know that this line is going to become the line of his cheek. Eye position. I'm curious, where is that going to land? Because that's going to say a lot. It's going to be somewhere around there. Okay. And we have a cresting point, which we're not showing here, but I'm going to guess somewhere around there. So we know that there is a shape right there that we have to work with. Yeah, something like that. Now we're, we're not going to leave it super flat, but that angle is important for us to understand. We have a point. This is where the flat of the lower lip begins. So let's bring that down straight for now. And let's just make an assumption that that is straight ahead. The jaw is there, so this has got to come up to nearly in front of the ear. Just 
just in front of the ear. You know what? This is actually going to be a decent line for that. So there's his jaw right there. So that's interesting coming together. Back of his head is interesting. Now we have to make a decision here. Just based on the side view, knowing that the back of the head is here how, and our crest sorry, is here, how do we reconcile this shape? It's not suggested anywhere here. We could, we could suggest it, but I, I think it's easier in this view. If this is the point, if that's the high point, and we have a sort of ridge, ridge coming down here. We can't leave it flat. Let's leave it flat for now, but I think there's, we have to create some interest in the profile that may not be suggested in the front view or the top view. We'll, de we'll decide that in a moment. Let's go back to the back of the head. This crest ends here as suggested in our top view, and we have to decide You know, if I come straight off the eye to the back of the head, this is going to be our furthest outside point. Let's just decide that now. This has got to reach this point somehow, but this suggests that there's an element here before it reaches the point. So we're going to leave that. Now I have to get our crest from here to here. It comes to a point so let's do let's do this. Let's do that. And we know it's going to fade forward to create this sort of shape. So this line continues up to the point. And I'm going to suggest that it goes all the way to the back. How does that look graphically from the that doesn't look too bad. And then this has got to come down. And let's just say neck dimensions, in terms of width of the neck, it's roughly the same width as it is the depth. So we're going to just go straight up, straight up. And it's roughly the width of the head. Let's do this. So just to help us out a little, we'll grab a marquee tool, bring it to the width of the head and drop this down. That's going to say to me, that is the width of the neck. And I'll just drop a regular guide and control D to remove the marquee. And I'm just going to make a thickness mark here. View clear guides. Now I have a, a neck position I can start to think about. Now. I'm a big believer in making sure the characters look like, if they're intelligent, that they have a medulla oblongata. No, I don't know. They, they look like they have space for a brain. So you've got to give a, them a little bit of room here. And then I want to think about posture. I don't want to think about if this is the pit of the neck, then you have the vertebrae starting here. And you have this neck coming here. If we're talking about this is a fairly humanoid type form, so we're going to have the large muscle making its way down here to the pit of the neck and the shoulders. We want to make sure we're angling things, shoulder blade, scapula, sorry. We suggest the rib cage here position. All right, so let's just start with something we recognize and if we want to change this or add to it, I think that that's okay. So I'm liking this so far. There's a very interesting 
There's a very interesting thing going on. Now the mouth appears to end here, but it also appears to come around the same depth of the eye. Just to make this slightly different, because they're not quite lined up, we're going to bring it forward to the jaw. And the tip of the ear, which we haven't put in, is roughly here. Now the ear, the tip of the ear is forward. The back of the ear is roughly centered. And it's roughly at this height. So we have an interesting profile starting here. We have a nub. We have a, a roll. We have an indentation. And then we have a flap. We're going to bring that flap in line. It's going to do something like that. And this lower part represents this lower part and it's going to fade into the face and we're going to start to see a little bit of jaw and we're going to start to see a bit of this sort of flap here coming into play and we're going to want to see a bit of this plane making its presence known in the jaw shape this feels like it's jutting a little forward and we can't tell from our top view so let's just bring that jaw forward and we'll fade them out all right so now we can begin to think about How is all of this really working? Do we like the profile that we're able to transfer over given some of the rules that we've set up for ourselves? And, and keep in mind, the side view is driven by the top view. Good decisions here drive your decisions here. And that doesn't mean we can't change them as we run into issues, but be mindful of that. And as you go forward, you'll be able to establish a usable side view that feels like it fits this uh, image. Uh, one of the things we haven't done is sort of shown the width here. Let's go back up here to the width. The width is there. Our maximum width on this is going to be here. So I think we're going to see a line depicting that here and it's going to it's kind of fade in to what is the crest roughly there and it's going to do something like that and I can see sort of in my mind these all being chipped up so I tell you what that is not a bad side profile I actually like the straightness of this element, the position of the eye in space on the side view. And as before, if we want to carry through with this, uh, we can create a um, we can create a further uh, illustration on top by taking our guides, dropping the opacity and coming back with a stronger uh, illustration over top of that. I think that basically illustrates the process and the reasons why the technique of this 45 degree reflection technique is um, necessary if you want to take images like this to another level and decide you know are we really are we really uh, making good decisions in terms of form creation uh, for characters like this. So. There you go. We can start to think about now um, what the rest of this character is going to feel like. There you go. Well, I'm, I'm a big believer in 
that profile, I should just say this, I want to bring down here. So I'm going to give him a very interesting sternum. I'm also going to give him a different kind of back. Oh, here we go. Start to play, drop in a core shadow and a reflection, and now we start to see a bit of what's happened, a bit of uh, playing. Here's your monkey. There you go. All right. There's a good example of uh, transferring information to other views using your character development image. It's just one more um, way to develop your piece, begin to understand when not using ZBrush or working directly in 3D what this could look like um, in another in another view. Oh, I'm getting carried away. All right. Okay guys, let's take a quick look at part of assignment two, uh, talking about flawed memory. I'm just going to discuss what I'd like you to do, and then I'm going to review what I've done to give you a, an example of what to expect, and I think you're going to find it very interesting. Um, we completed our painting, we did the transfer of side views here, and uh, then what I did was set this aside, and uh, I reviewed it that evening and set it aside, and then in the morning, I did a quick two-minute pencil sketch of, of what I felt I remembered of this image. Now you can see some clear differences uh, in sort of uh, how much information is here and how much information is here. Uh, in terms of the approach, one was very technical, the other is a little more um, caricatured and shaded. It's taken a little further and it's answering a few more questions. but. In a couple of minutes sketch, why is that? Why didn't it look more like this? Why it, did it turn into this this sort of more shaded, more thought out, uh, more realistic and um, finished image? Well, let's let's discuss how that might have happened. I mean, our memory is flawed, and everybody's is and it affects our ability to interpret information. And giving ourselves that day to think about it allows us to absorb the information and filter it in a different way. And when we're relying, I think, on uh, our memory to do that, we begin to add aspects of information to our image to fill in the blanks of what we remember. We're using our, another knowledge base. We're trying to solve um, issues of form and structure and essentially fill in the blanks that our memory can't using the using the um, skills we have and the knowledge that we have. So when I when I look at this in the comparison, this is a fairly hard, straight on side view. There's a lack of posture, a lack of life. It's a bit stiff. When we go to this one, I, you know, I unconsciously start bringing aspects of uh, life to this. A little bit of shading a little bit of wrinkles and compression behind the neck, a little bit of stretching here at the jaw. I create some angularity which kind of reveals more of a caricatured approach in my style for quick sketches. And I think that's just from training myself to block out 
um, characters so that I can get the, the shapes out quickly. So that's one technical aspect of my images that I like. And there's some other aspects here that are sort of technical errors that need to be addressed in, in, in my style. One is sort of the lack of information in certain areas or the lack of shading and form generation. We have areas of this image which seem to just flatten out here at the neck. Around here this is sort of unresolved. I mean this isn't really overly resolved but the limerick in here indicates a lot of information. Some of this in terms of the you know our, my interpretation from memory I couldn't fill in that blank. And that can indicate a few things. One, a, a technical issue, as I had I indicated, or a lack of knowledge of the anatomy in this area and not being able to apply it to solve the issue. So there's something we should think about when we review the next day's sketch and we do a, a clear analysis uh, of our work so that we can begin to improve. Now, having a memory uh, sketch like this uh, I think is important and I hope that you follow through as part of the assignment because it is going to help you assess your work, learn the differences between what your style is and what a flaw in technique might be, and give you the opportunity to correct those in, um, in your own personal work and on your own personal time. Because I think the when you're in a work setting and you can uh, recognize those issues. You can make the correct corrections and move forward quickly and that's something that I think is important for everybody um, you know in a work setting. In your personal work when you're you know creating work to sell or you're you're trying to create a portfolio piece or something like that being able to self-assess and correct uh, is a good thing because you're going to be putting your best work forward and it's going to train another train you uh, to sort of re review your work um, at arm's length and make good decisions. So doing this this uh, exercise helps you see the differences, uh, gives you an opportunity to begin to understand what you bring to the table in terms of style based on memory and the way you filter information, gives you an opportunity to address sort of technical aspects of your sketches and be critical. I think you need to be critical. Uh, it's better for you to do it at home in the privacy of uh, your home and get and be rough on yourself first so that you can make those corrections and you're preparing yourself for what you might expect in a work setting. Um, but it really gives us uh, I think a thorough uh, understanding of where we stand with our style and allows us to make choices in its uh, development. So when I look at this for me, I say it's a very caricatured cartoonish style. There are great aspects of geometry in here that I like. Uh, there's a lack of shading and form development in certain areas which will have to be addressed. And I think that there is a lack of the understanding of anatomy in this area that I want to go back and look at so that I can in the future when I'm creating sketches in a work setting, address them appropriately. There's some imaginative stuff going on here with the sternum, what this muscle might be, what this sort of joint style system might be. There's some creative stuff going on. Um, and that's great because we I was able to add that to the sketch based on other experience and knowledge. But when I analyze this, uh, you know, technically there's some aspects that I want to correct. So go through this assignment and uh, compare your new sketch with your evenings, be critical, and then, you know, make some notes on how you think you can improve. And the secret to, to doing that, uh, secret to improving on that is to actually uh, move uh, forward in your next sketch, next sketch knowing what those notes are. So you have to act on what you find. Um, okay, good luck to you with this assignment. I hope that uh, it helps you out. I think you're going to find some interesting uh, information. You're going to reveal a lot about your style. And uh, if you're analyzing this critically, uh, you're going to improve greatly. All right, so take care. I hope this helps out. And I think the next thing we're going to review is um, looking at our context library and creating a written design brief to uh, get our uh, information together so we can start sculpting. All right, see you in the next one.
Hi everybody. We're going to uh, just go over the uh, last assignment for week one and this is uh, assignment three, uh, developing a written design brief. So let's go back and look at our context library that you've created because our design brief, our written design brief, is going to be inspired by the images that you've uh, collected or created. So the context library contains uh, this selection of folders uh, which you have populated with images and I have as well. Uh, I've got the technology, the body forms here and I've added a shells and a mollusk shape that I really like. Um, camo, uh, clothing, some examples of uh, sort of styles and uh, colors. Color swatches which we've created and other images which we may create um, color swatches from in the future as we go forward. Uh, styles of culture, uh, I like Western culture. And then we have uh, images of the ecology, uh, which sort of set the scene for land types, plant types, um, atmosphere, levels of water, all kinds of things that I can draw from these images that will help me decide on a direction as we develop our character biologically within ZBrush. Environmental, this is an example of sort of a mood, the sky setting, amount of moisture, um, you know, these all look very strong in terms of weather, so I'm thinking of a, a, a windy environment. Um, we have the eye image, uh, which is not really an eye image. It's that wonderful river going down a mountain, but it does inspire some interesting shapes. Um, gravity. I haven't selected an image here yet, but I'm going to. I think I'm look, going to be looking for just a, a image which suggests um, earthly gravity. I'm not going to go too crazy on this this one. Predator prey. I have two images. One of the um, sort of wild hog and this African uh, tiger or African lion. Sorry. And uh, reproduction. So I have images here of uh, plant reproduction, which I'm going to bring into aspects of the character. Scale figure. We're going to use that later on. And the weirding way. I've selected a set of words uh, based on our discussions earlier, and I'm going to try and bring these into our uh, or into my uh, one paragraph setting uh, for the uh, character here in our design brief. So let's let's quickly go over what is a design brief. All right, what is, uh, our, we've spoken a little bit about the context library being a visual design brief, but what is it, uh, what is it really? Well, a written design brief in commercial terms uh, is typically a document summarizing information mined through the use of targeted questionnaires. And usually I'm the guy designing the questionnaire. The client fills it out so that I know what their goals are, what they're trying to achieve in the project that we are being asked to, to work on. Um, it's designed to dissect client needs and goals. So um, that, is, um, that is our goal as well. In the context of character development, the written design brief is uh, in part a script, uh, if you've been provided one or if you are creating one, and uh, our use of the weirding way, all the words that we've selected, and all the elements collected in the context library or the visual brief, including all of the sketches you developed and the painting that you created. So all that work together uh, we're going to consider part of the brief. And now we're going to do a little written uh, a brief that brings it all together. All right? This is all about depicting the circumstances which form the setting for your character. Right? It helps us to develop the why, uh, which will lead us uh, a little closer to the how. So there doesn't need to be a like full-on body description of your character in terms of look. That's going to happen in ZBrush when we do live silhouette generation. Here it's about setting uh, a scene and a mood, um, giving uh, the character some context in terms of what's going to happen when we when we set up our our character, our scene, and uh, and you know drive a little bit of the development of the character in terms of look based on what he's doing uh, in this scene. So just give me a moment. I'm going to write a brief paragraph based on what I've got here, and then we'll go over it. And I think you'll see some, uh, uh, some clear connections between this library and what I've written. All right, I'll just pause that, and I'll just type it up right now. Okay, so I've spent about five or ten minutes kind of putting this together, fixing my spelling errors. Uh, and let's have a look at what's here. So Phil sat atop his work totem, crouched 
in the same familiar position, his back to the gritty wind protecting the crumbling embers of his dung forage. He craned his long neck to peer over his shoulder, trying to look for the source of the low moan which seemed to circle him at the outskirts of his forge light. He looked past the dark curtain into several sets of hungry eyes. He cheerfully palmed the warm hammerstone, turned back to his work, and began to tap the softened metal atop the Incas block. He smirked to himself, the forge light glinting off the slowly sharpening alloy. The sooner he finished his work, the sooner he could have something to eat. So, I mean, it's a, it's a very short um, paragraph, but it describes a, a character in a scene um, that pulls from the context library. So clearly there's some connections there with the the forge and the hammerstone based on some of the technology. Um, there's uh, connections to a mood here, the cheerfulness. Um, the uh, Incas block, the Incas is a word for uh, an anvil. I just like this one better. He he smirked to himself. So we have, we have to think about, well, if our character is smiling and he's an alien how do we how do we get this feeling across that he has got that kind of uh, look on his face um, you know we've brought eyes into this um, this description and there is a sense of uh, a little bit of danger but also humor here um, so all this stuff, the gritty wind based on sort of the windswiftness of the of the atmosphere images is here. Um, this is going to be interesting and this just came from sort of looking at the context library and making some assumptions about what our character does, what type of technology does he work with, where is he in his in evolution in terms of um, you know ability to use materials and intelligence, things like that. Um, you know, he's living, he seems to be out in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by darkness and danger and animals. So it's not a safe environment. So we're going to have a very interesting time developing this character, setting that scene, and, uh, you know, bringing a sense of uh, life and background to the character. And having this paragraph helps us um, helps us do that, helps us develop a character with something in mind and some context. And that's what we're looking for, context. We want a well-grounded start to the development of the biology of our character. And there's a lot of things in this, including our context library, which helps us um, determine that. So I'd like you to go through your work, pare down your images, create a paragraph based on the context library and this is going to become uh, our uh, basis uh, our context for the development of forms in ZBrush. So I hope you're looking forward to live silhouetting there and uh, good luck with this. We'll review them. Uh, I want you to review them and hopefully I get a chance to look at them as well before we start week two. Alright, take care and uh, good luck.